It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My next guest is Griffin Dunn. Griffin is primarily an actor. He has over 85 credits to his name. Recently, he starred alongside Katherine Hahn in the Amazon show I Love Dick. He was also in the Dallas Buyers Club. He starred in An American Werewolf in London and in the 1985 Scorsese classic After Hours. There you go. Fair is a dollar and a half. What? Fair went up to a dollar and a half as of midnight. You're kidding. I've got 97 cents. No. It's raining like mad out there. No. Would you just give me a break? I really just want to go home. I'm oh, sorry. I can't do that. I could lose my job. Well, who would, who would know exactly? I could go to a party, get drunk, talk to someone. Who knows? He's also a director. He made the movies Fierce People and Practical Magic, along with the Oscar-nominated short film The Duke of Groove. Now he's directed his first documentary. It's a biography of his aunt, Joan Didion, one of the most critically acclaimed contemporary writers. Didion rose to fame for her journalism. She immersed herself in stories. In the late 1960s, she broke through with slouching towards Bethlehem. In her career, she covered a bunch of different stuff, the counterculture, war, immigration. She also wrote a handful of novels and a few memoirs. She's led a fascinating life, but until now, there hadn't been a documentary about her. She's pretty private. She doesn't give a lot of interviews, either. The film is called Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold. It's an intimate look at one of the most compelling thinkers alive. It talks about her impact on journalism, her fiction, too. Dunn also focuses on one of the biggest tragedies to strike Didion's life. In 2003, her husband John Dunn died of a heart attack. Not long afterwards, she lost her daughter, Quintana Roo Dunn. Here's a little bit from the documentary. In this clip, Didion is reading from her book, The Year of Magical Thinking, which talks about the loss of her husband. I did not want the year after either of them died to end. I knew that as the second year began and days passed, certain things would happen. My image of them at the moment of death would become something that happened in another year. My sense of John and Quintana themselves, John and Quintana alive, would become more remote, softened, transmuted into whatever best served my life without them. In fact, this is already happening. For once in your life, just let it go. Griffin Dunn, welcome to Bullseye. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Jesse. Good to be here. Were you scared to make a documentary about your aunt? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I did feel this incredible burden. From the moment she said, uh, yeah, okay, when I asked if she'd let me make a doc, the the gravity of what I had taken on hit. You know, it was uh, there was a lot to be, uh, you know, concerned and worried as scared is just as good a word you know i i grew up knowing as so many know that this is the importance that she has in the world and 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 the intense passion and ownership so much so many of her readers have about her work and and she's been such an influence on on so many people uh, you know from whether they become a writer or where they live or you know benchmarks in their life they can they can equate to what they were reading of hers so I, I i hope to deliver something that would both honor her work and and show her fans or and people who didn't know anything about her what you know what she's like in her in her home and how much she laughs and and is and is engaged despite the gravitas and and uh, heaviness of of uh, of her observations about America and its darkest periods, um, that she is actually, you know, um, my Aunt Joan, who I grew up with hearing laughing all the time. I mean, one of the things that would scare me about making this movie, and it's also an incredible opportunity in making this movie, is that your Aunt Joan Didion has, you know, in attaining icon status. One of the odd things about that is that 
uh, icons are necessarily abstracted. You know, they're reduced to a few lines. And your aunt had become like almost as much a, a, an object of like aesthetic admiration, like visual aesthetic admiration. Absolutely. As anything else. So mm -hmm. this brilliant, brilliant writer, one of the greatest of her generation, it ran the risk of being the beautifully cool woman in the big sunglasses holding a cigarette in these famous images of her in the 1960s and 70s. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I've always thought that one of the reasons that her, that she gained such readership at that period was that the photographs, those Julian Wasser photos of her standing in front of the, 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 the stingray, that's what drove people to the bookstore. They wanted to know who that woman was. What, what was she writing about? What was she like? You know, there was a section in the in the in the uh, in the movie that that didn't uh end up making it that kind of addressed her image you know how conscious she was about it and and how conscious other people were about it and we interviewed uh phoebe philo who was a the marketing director at at um celine who was the woman that had the idea of putting Joan in a in a, a Celine ad, uh, a fashion ad, you know, and and it was enormously successful uh, and unusual to have an eighty year old woman in the big sunglasses promoting sunglasses or shoes. I don't know what they were selling, but uh, it whatever it is, it really caught on and sold very well. Um, she's she's always represented visually something very important to people. But I mean, that's a. That is both a gift to you and a challenge. I mean, the gift is that there are these beautiful images to show, and your aunt remains very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're making a movie. You're looking at things. Yeah, a visual medium. On the other hand, you have to think about, well, how do I let this, uh, you know, specifically non-visual art be represented in this you know, when I'm surrounded by all these incredibly powerful images. Uh, yeah, that was that was certainly that was certainly the challenge. Um, and you know, her, um, you know, in her writing, that was always the, the the intent was to also visualize her her prose. You know, and and but and 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 the things that she writes about. You know, from slouching, the center will not hold. There are these incredible images of, of families falling apart and 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 boards of lost and missing children that she she talks about and so putting the putting the pictures to uh, her writing and putting her at from that time from the pictures taken at that time they 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 blended very well together it was sort of you know making that collage fabric kind of tapestry was was really the most fun in the editorial process was part of why you wanted to tell this story about your aunt that you and she share particularly in light of her more recent books which have been about grieving mm -hmm. that you and she share a kind of survivorship status in this, you know, big exciting family, that it, that that you know, you, there are further generations of your family, but you and she are sort of the last two standing in a way. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say I was I I was very aware of that, but that that wasn't really the reason for making the movie. Um, but I was, you know, uh, you know, when John died, my 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 father kind of was sort of next in line to be like John. And then when he died, then I was. You know, I have dinner with, uh, you know, her, she has a group of friends and of which, you know, um, and myself, all, all of us have dinner with her, you know, maybe once or twice a week. And she has, four, you know, people over all the time. So I, I long before I'd ever thought of a, of the documentary, I was just sort of aware of, gosh, how I fit through attrition into her life. Um, what really motivated me was that I 
I I didn't realize there'd never been a documentary about her. And I, I kind of felt without getting too kind of heavy about it, I thought because of, you know, this is what I do is, is make movies, while not documentaries necessarily, I felt obligated to, to ask and, and, and to make it because I knew, I knew besides being a, a, a very personal experience for me, I also knew that there was a, a real hunger for this, that there was like, a, that this would be something people would really, really want to see which has borne itself out. And, and, you know, we had a way I got some of the money was, was through a Kickstarter campaign. And the campaign had a trailer and to raise money. Well, we raised money like by lunch on our first day. And, um, and then the comments and the, and, the, and the attention of the press from all over the world was huge. I'd never seen anything like it. So, um, I kind of felt like um, like I was providing a service as well, you know, giving really able, uh, being the only person able to give what a lot of people really wanted to see. I want to play a clip from the movie, and my guest is Griffin Dunn. Uh, he's directed a new documentary called The Center Will Not Hold uh, about his aunt, Joan Didion. And... One of the defining works of her career has been a, a piece that became a book called Slouching Towards Bethlehem. It, it's about, as you described, Griffin, the kind of human realities of the abstract ideas about hippiedom and, and the sort of broader social meaning. And there's this scene in the piece that's about... Uh, Joan Didion going to this apartment in San Francisco. She sees this little girl wearing white lipstick, licking her lips, five years old, and she's on acid. What was it like to be a journalist in the room when you saw the little kid on acid? Well, it was, let me tell you, it was gold. I mean, th that's the long and the short of it is you, you you live for the for, mom, for moments like that if you're if you if you're doing a piece, good or bad. That might be the most intense. <laughs> it really is. I, I I'd never. It's the most amazing movie, m moment in the movie. Um, I never tire of looking at it. To me, that line is 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 just pure Joan. That says everything. When I saw that moment happen, I saw I saw the structure of the film. I saw the 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 character, kind of. How, how how the balance goes from family to the the work, and because at that time her daughter Quintana was two and a half years old, she was going to San Francisco for weeks at a time on assignment, and she missed her daughter terribly. So she could miss her daughter terribly, and then see a five year old be in this horrific situation, and you think she's going to say, you know, what was it like? Well, it was, and you think she's going to say. The most horrible thing I ever saw as a mother, I feel so deeply. I must... No, she says it was gold. She can draw the line between how she sees the world as a journalist and how she feels things as a mother. And that's how it's played out all her life. You know, when, when... so she can write a book like Year of Magical Thinking, she can write about it to investigate her own grief as, as, a, uh, as a wife and and as a mother who's in, in loss and grief, but she can write about it like a reporter. That's that's her balance, and that's the balance I tried to create in the movie as well. Was it difficult to ask your aunt about the deaths of your uncle and cousin, which are, you know, central to her work and central to the film? Yeah, yeah, very much. I, I think in a way... Um, Anyway, I had a harder time asking than she did answering. Um, I think both were tough, but uh, I, I felt, you know, making her have to relive it and and talk about it. But at the same time, you know, she she's a journalist and is being interviewed, and she knows, of course, I'm going to ask that and probably would not have any respect for me if I didn't you know, go there. Um, so um, she was, um, while it was very tough, 
Um, there'd be also moments in the silences where she'd, you know, look up and go, you know, keep going, bring it on. I know where you're going. Um, so I guess in a funny way, she made it, you know, easier. But it was extremely difficult. I want to talk before we're out of time with you a little bit about your acting career. Mm -hmm. You studied with three, three of the most important acting teachers of the 20th century. You were at the Neighborhood Playhouse during the very end of Sanford Meisner's career. Mm -hmm. You studied with Uta Hagen. Mm -hmm. um, and in Los Angeles, you studied with Stella Adler. That's right. Those are three teachers, each of whom has a very different perspective on acting. So starting with Sanford Meisner, uh, with whom you studied, and also with whose protégés you, you'd yeah. studied, because I think he was, he was very late in his life, um, what did you learn about acting from him? Before I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse, I, I uh, uh, had known who Sanford Meisner was, and I'd read the, a book about the group theater that Helga Klerman had written, and I knew the roots from Stanislavski, and so I knew I was going to... Uh, Oh, and then on top of that, my father um, had also briefly studied with Sanford Meisner. He originally wanted to be a, an actor or a movie star, as he said. And, <laughs> um, and Sanford said, you'll never make it as a movie star. You're too short. And dad took him at his word and, and quit acting. So I knew this was the guy who told my dad he was too short to be an actor. And I'm not that much taller. <laughs> yeah, I I I want to I want to I want to retroactively uh, let your father know in case he, he's listening from heaven uh, that I know from my own acting career as a very tall person uh, that while it is great in the world to be tall, uh, it does not particularly help on camera. Yeah, yeah, it's not a shoe in. <laughs> It's like the one place where it's not worth anything. <laughs> no, actually, uh, you know, Alan Ladd didn't need uh, that height. Yeah, they just, that's what they Tom had. Tom Cruise isn't sweating Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's what they got those uh, boxes for, um, to stand on. But um, so so when when I got there, it was bad for me, and I know worse for him, but it was still bad for me that, that Mr. Meisner's larynx was removed shortly before I arrived. So he was speaking through one of those machines, you know, it was very monotone and it was, you know, very, uh, it was really weird because I'd, I'd seen stuff of him, you know, energetically, you know, getting involved in scenes with other actors, with the other actors and everything. So when I got there, it was, um, I don't want to do the voice. It'll sound like I'm making fun of it, but 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 it, it 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 was it was to be getting notes as if by a computerized machine. I thought ah, I just missed it. You know, if if I just got here a year earlier, then I'd really get the Samford ex Meisner experience. That's a really like uh, uh, twenty. I don't know how old you were. I'm going to say twenty. Mm, younger. Uh, that, that's. Yeah, so that's a teenage act. That's a teenage actor's perspective. Oh, without a doubt, on a man's yes, I'm making life it leaving all, him. But still, an actor who's going to be around because I'm making it all about me. Yeah. Um, so I did, however, get the full, um, the full head-on experience with with Uta Hagen, who uh, was was truly terrifying. Um, and you know, and she for anyone who doesn't immediately recognize her name, she among other things wrote the book Respect for Acting, which is probably uh, the first uh, the first book that they hand you in any acting school, yeah. um, and was you know a, 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 an immensely legendary teacher into the into the twenty first century. She she only died ten or twelve years ago. Exactly, and she and and on on Broadway she was the very first Martha. Uh, in and Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and her method was still the the most effective and the most helpful that's uh, that I've known to this day. But she had a uh, she was tough, tough, tough. And uh, what I what I learned was um, the worst thing that could happen would be if she didn't yell at you, because it meant she didn't really care. And the most cutting thing I ever saw happen was two actors in a scene that clearly wasn't going very well. 
she just didn't even take the time. And she just went, oh, okay, darlings. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Who's up? And you could just feel a chill. Um, and those, I, I don't know where those two young actors are today, but, but that was a bad day for them. But she, you know, if she, it was like that, that kind of old school thing where I like you so much, I believe in you so much, I'm going to torture you um, so that you can withstand all the hurt you're going to face once you leave this classroom and go out in the professional world. And then uh, Stella, <laughs> Stella I had for uh, one summer in Los Angeles. She, she was very, comp you know, she was very helpful with me when I did a real serious scene. But when she get excited about something, she would hold on to her, her dress, the blouse that she had on, the the, and and she go, you gotta feel it from your heart. And she pulled down her hands, holding onto her dress, and expose her breasts for one shocking brief moment, and then pull the dress back up. And the cast would go, oh! and but that would be like, it's got to come from there. So I loved her. <laughs> well, Griffin Dunn, I'm, I've used uh, more of your time than had been allotted to me. So thank you so much for making the time to, to come and be on Bullseye. Thank you, Ted. Griffin Dunn. His documentary, Joan Didion, The Center Will Not Hold, is in theaters and on Netflix right now. Go check it out. It's a beautiful movie. If you want to read a book of Jones, my producer Kevin says you should start with Play It As It Lays. That's Kevin's recommendation, red hot off the presses. <laughs>